Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that will hopefully matter to you. Today, we are excited to welcome a remarkable guest, Elizabeth Miller, the founder and owner of The Happy Healthy Caregiver. Welcome, Elizabeth. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So. You started as a family caregiver and you kind of have taken that experience and have created a wonderful, remarkable resource for families and for caregivers called the Happy Healthy Caregiver. What made you decide to create the Happy Healthy Caregiver website, the podcast in your community? I wish it existed for me is the short answer. Um, Back in 2014, things were spiraling out of control with my own parents health issues and my husband juggling the health of his mom and our kids were middle school years and one heading into high school and we were working full time and we were losing our minds and I just felt this is really hard and why doesn't anybody talk about this and why isn't anybody helping people like me? How long were you a caregiver for your family, your parents? It's hard to put an exact number on it because they've had health issues my entire adult life but things really started spiral in 2014 and my dad passed later that year in 2014 and my mother-in-law after a four-year battle of um, lung cancer Mm -hmm. died also died in 2014 and it was at that point that i really became a primary caregiver for my mom all her grandkids to remember this prayer okay let me say it angel of god my guardian dear to whom his love commits me here. Ever this day be at my side, to light, to guide, to rule and guard. Amen. Amen, Mama. For about a year and a half while juggling work and kids, and at that, I got to be too much. Um, She wasn't quite a fit for the assisted living communities. We tried different ones. My sister, my older sister had a life change and she wanted to, to, take and take her turn at being mom's caregiver. And so then I became kind of a support long distance caregiver for my mom. I also have a brother, an older brother who has a intellectual developmental disability, uh, neurodivergent. And we now share the care with my brother because it, my parents are now deceased. Okay. So there's caregiving is especially in a big family. I think it's just something that is always kind of there. And, you know, you touched on something that I think a lot of families who are either a caregiver for a loved one or have been in the past. And with our company, we encounter this all too often, and it's still far too common. And this you're talking about back in 2014. Here we're in 2022, and we're still hearing the same things from families and from caregivers. I wish I knew about this when. And How do you see that changing? Have you seen any improvements in families becoming more aware of resources and support as they're caring for their family members? I, you know, I definitely think there is, is better, is more, but what I do see is that it's people like myself and like you and the business owners that we are trying to combine our strengths and resources and make it better for family caregivers. The process of, you know, our government institutions and things like that are, is is slower, way slower. And I think we can't wait, you know, care can't wait for, for them to to catch up with the with the stuff that's the tsunami that's going on. I do think I, I, another positive place I see changes with employers. I think employers are really um, looking to build an environment that that's welcoming to a working family caregiver. And in fact, I just got off a presentation with an employee resource group for a company. Um, and there's more and more companies doing these groups for caregivers that then they're making them mightier and stronger by providing them with, with resources. And so that's, that's a positive change. I think 
another place I'd love to see more change happen is in healthcare right. professionals where that's really the entry point into a caregiving situation is, you know, it's clear that I'm the person now even more clear with them designating on the form that there's a person that's responsible for helping this other person with their activities of daily care and other things. But to, to see the change there and that just seeing the family caregiver, that they're the person taking the notes or pushing the wheelchair or asking the questions and seeing that individual as a, as a critical part to the team and not just shooting all over them as far as the care that they can better provide their care recipient, but what are the resources you're going to give them to enable them and empower them in this critical role in our society. Absolutely. And it's just going to be more and more needed for the next 20, 30 years too. And that's the yes. thing. I know we, we had a family recently who newly married the one, the gentleman was, you know, um, working towards medical school. The wife was just starting out her, you know, career after, you know, college graduation. And then a parent literally just gets dumped into their lap needing 24 hour care. And they were sharing with us, they had been managing that for two full years and not one time did the social worker, a doctor, a nurse ever suggest or even make them aware of, you know, professional caregiving services that could help alleviate some of their own responsibilities as a family caregiver or even make mention of other options. And that goes to your point where a lot of it starts with the healthcare professionals, you know, these doctor's offices, these rehab facilities and these hospitals when they're doing, you know, discharge planning or, you know, care planning and helping the families also. It's not just, yes, the, the care and the needs of that patient are priority one, but you also have to look at the bigger picture. Once that person's no longer under their care or an inpatient setting, what kind of support do they have? And our family's able to provide that support, you know, and that kind of, you know, segues to your situation. You're, you're a parent with two children. You work a full-time job. You're still helping, you know, to care for family member. How do you integrate the self-care as you're managing and I'll say juggling all of these, you know, tremendous responsibilities that you have? intentionally is the short answer um you know it, for me it was a wake-up call with i was caring for my parents who had chronic comorbidities and my mother-in-law who had lung cancer and it was essentially their lifestyle choices that had put them in the situation of high care needs for our family and it really you know i had a lot of reflective time thinking back and forth on these trips initially to florida to see my family from Georgia. And it just was a light bulb moment for me where I thought, if I don't figure this out of how to like, start to prioritize my own health, and my own happiness, I am going to repeat the same exact cycle for my kids. Sure. And same with my husband, and we were just like, adamant to not be able to do that. So it, it was not something I tell, you know, family caregivers, you're not going to find the time. You're never going to find the time for your, your own health and happiness. You do have to be intentional and it, in the same things you would tell your best friend are the things that you need to honor and tell yourself. And it's about scheduling the time and really putting it on my calendar. And that was, that was where I had to start. For me, it was a, a new habits that I had to form. I was so overwhelmed by all the to do items that it felt like another to do to take care of, of myself and that's really where happy healthy caregiver came about is i thought i gotta figure out how to how to really live this that this isn't something that we just should on them as another thing to do and i'm gonna share my process while and figure out what's gonna work for me um and I, you know, I invite people to, as an, as a first step to just even take a picture on, on Instagram of like a diary of what you were going to do or what you did for yourself um, in that day. And it could just be, you know, a, a good meal choice, taking a couple extra steps, right. having a, some solid breath. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think just to elaborate on that a little bit, we often find two reasons that caregivers, family caregivers say they can't practice self-care. 
one is either they don't think they have the time for it or two, they feel like it's being selfish if they do practice it yeah. because they're neglecting or trying to shun their responsibilities or, you know, another family member or one of their friends or somebody might judge them because they're taking time out for themselves. And really in a perfect world, and you may agree with this, part of being a family caregiver, one of the responsibilities should be practicing self-care, right? I mean, that should just be an automatic, just like it is, you know, I got to make sure mom gets her medications in the morning. You need to make sure you get your time in the morning for yourself or in the evening or whenever you find it. Because if something happens to you, as the old saying goes, what happens to your loved one, right? I, I mean, I do challenge caregivers. I do complimentary coaching and, and ongoing coaching with some caregivers. And, you know, it, it's a process that we have to walk through to kind of reframe this mindset because it is counterintuitive to think about, especially the, the, the role of a caregiver. These people are naturally um, people that just do a lot for other people. But I even think back to like when I worked in a company, we wouldn't even put our president, our CEO and a CFO on the same airplane because, you know, if something happened to them, the whole company would would dissolve and, and be in shambles. And then you're affecting so many different lives. It's the same as you're the hub of the wheel as the primary caregiver. And it is if you're not in a mental um, in an emotional state and a physical state where you can manage all these meteors coming at you um, and the crisis of the day, like you're, you're just not going to be in a, it's not going to be a sustainable position. And for some people, as we live longer and longer, caregiving can last, that season can be a very long season for people and making it sustainable is, is critical to, to what that looks like. And you even our luxury cars, we got to give them gas and um, the car thing. washes and things like what makes us think that we can just go, 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 go without. Um, and then if that doesn't work, usually when I say that to family care, caregiver, the other thing I'll say is like, maybe your loved one needs a break from you. Right. <laughs> you know, like you need the respite. They need the respite from you, like get some other people to be um, involved in this. And and I think if the pandemic showed us anything, too, is that crises can happen and we've got to have not just a plan B, but quite a few extra plan Absolutely. C, D, E and F. Yes, absolutely. And so. Elizabeth, you, you created this wonderful resource and it's so it's multifaceted. It's not just one specific thing. You're, you're an author of the self care journal. Um, you're a part of many wonderful organizations and have these tremendous credentials for caregiving and senior care and resources for these families. What would you say makes your resources and community different than the other resources that are out there encouraging family caregivers? What sets aside the happy, healthy caregiver from maybe yes. some other resource? I think a couple things. One is I think it's very practical and pragmatic resources that you're going to get. Uh, you know, I've, I've been there as a family caregiver. I'm going to fast track you to the resources. I'm learning every day and and thinking about caregivers all the time and how things would help them. Even on the podcast, like the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast, we spotlight um, or I spotlight, I should say, uh, family caregivers. I believe family caregivers are the experts in caregiving. Agreed. That there are lots of doctors and people and, I, and they want to be on my podcast. But I would much rather have somebody that can really give the practical, pragmatic tips about caregiving and, and really how they're infusing self-care in their day. Like get some different voices other than just me on what it looks like to be a happy, healthy caregiver, um, that that's what you're going to get. Like this, the real resources and power comes from the caregiving community. And, and I just want to compliment the name happy, healthy caregiver, because I think automatically first, it just puts such a sunny, positive spin on something that can also not always be happy and sometimes not always healthy. But the goal is, is to equip these family caregivers so that they can try to avoid some of those pitfalls that they're going to come into regardless of the situation to maintain that happiness, you know, their mood and their physical health, because that's, those are things that are going to sustain you as you're going through this caregiving journey. You know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows as they say, but 
it's rewarding at the end of the day, right? And yes. I've I personally have not met too many caregivers that say I would never do that again. You know, it may be times during it you might utter that occasionally, right? But at the end and you look back and you see what a remarkable difference you made in your loved one's life, it usually makes a remarkable difference in your life also. Ooh, you're choking me up now, Lance, because like, it, I mean, it is something that I would, I would definitely would not change it. I, it's, it's been life changing for me, career changing, uh, you know, all, all thought consuming sometimes, um, even with now in the, in the advocacy role and a coaching role. Um, but I, I, to your point, I do believe in my heart that people can be amazing, yeah. fabulous family caregivers and, and still live happy, healthy lives themselves. This is, um, I think, e even in particularly in a caregiving situation, when I go back and reflect on the caregiving years, there were so many emotional roller coaster moods, but just as much as the sad moments stick out, so do the joyful moments. I think there's such intense joy because you're such you're so grateful for it. Right. In Absolutely. those moments. Absolutely. So let's talk about your book. The self, uh, the self care <laughs> journal, and 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 I can see how passionate you are, you know, about this. And there it is. What what is the ideal goal or benefit you're hoping that the readers will take away from your self care journal? I studied journalism in college, so journaling. And then when I reflected back, I did a, a talk lately on journaling, and I've been journaling in some form or fashion my entire life. I just had been. It's looked different. But journaling during caregiving was therapeutic for me. I started, you know, I did I didn't end up being a journalist in my professional career. I did IT and strategy for a company, but writing was something that I started carving out for myself as far as trying on different self-care things and activities and seeing what really felt healing for me. And it was writing. And so I would go to Starbucks before work a couple mornings a week and I would just write. Um, and it was helping me process what was going on with caregiving and really giving meaning to my role and affirming, you know, how, how difficult it is. I wanted other caregivers to have a taste of that without feeling like it was a, not everybody wants to sit and write, you know, and, and write out paragraphs. Um, so the journal is, it's meant to be a, a help them prioritize their self care by giving them a prompt, um, a, a little prompt such as, you know, what is something you wish you knew more about? Like that was something we talked about, or what's one happy memory related to childhood you have? Because it is a practice of self care. And so all of the prompts and questions kind of get back to that sense of self about family caregivers, because sometimes we lose ourselves in this process of caregiving. And it's a low entry point to to make to getting that habit. And whether you do it every day or not, like it's okay. You know, this this isn't another job to do. It's like one of those things, try it on, see if it if it works for you. Work for me, might work for you, might not. Wonderful. And so let's talk about some happy healthcare or happy, healthy caregiver tips. What would be your top three tips that you would provide to a family caregiver who's just starting out and one who might be right in the middle of the throes of caregiving for a family member? Yes. You know, I get this question and it, the answers kind of change depending sure. on the time, but I would say top thing is um, find a support group that um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a traditional caregiving support group, but find your people that are going to understand your situation because because I do believe that caregivers are the real family ex caregiving experts. They're going to know, particularly in your local community, who the reputable home care agencies are, who the great doctors are how they're handling a certain situation, but the local community resources, because sometimes resources for caregivers are not just about home care and doctors, but they're also about the person who's going to come to the house and cut mom's hair or the mobile dog groomer, or, you know, the person that will, will do the lawn care for this house that has overgrown weeds. Like those are also resources for, Absolutely. for caregivers. So support group would be number one. Um, and second one, I would say related to home care actually is you to think that we can always be there and do it all is, um, is, is not a real situation. Like things are going to happen. Emergencies, crisis, we get sick. Again, we saw that during the pandemic, fill out the paperwork. 
just fill out the paperwork for home care. You, you know, you, you know, more than anybody, I don't tell you, you've got to usually get an assessment of come in. They got to meet your care recipient, got to talk about different things. They might require certain types of a care plan and understanding about stuff, but at least take the step of picking up the phone and filling out the paperwork um, so that you know that you have a plan for when a crisis happens. And then I would recommend you actually test it out right. and see before a crisis happens, what it would look like to have somebody come in and not necessarily, I think sometimes people say, oh, my loved one doesn't want somebody to come in. It's like, sometimes it's not just about them. It's about you, like yeah. again, right. this, yes. this burnout. Um, and see, third tip I would say um, is, yeah, do something for yourself every, every, at least every day, if it could, if it's possible, like just even if it's just hiding in the bathroom for five minutes and taking a few breaths, right. but try on different things because it's, you know, for me, I'm not a bubble bath girl, like it's not going to work for me. So, but cleaning my desk off might be better self care for me today like that's going to give me more peace of mind so it's trying on different things and knowing who you are. And what self care looks like for you and figuring out how you can implement that in your life, those are those are wonderful tips and. You know you've talked about this where you know with the healthcare professionals and it's not to beat up on them but you know they have a specific role to play they can't be expected to know everything and to do everything either that's why we have different sections and divisions of healthcare in different roles. But if you could change one or two things, what would be Elizabeth's number one or number two things that she would like to see changed as it relates to the healthcare sector and for caregivers? If I went it's into a, a doctor's, yeah. doctor's office or went into a hospital and somebody gave, if I saw something related to family caregivers, as far as like a resource sheet a handout, an upcoming support group, a webinar. If I was sitting at the TV, like while I'm scrolling through channels and there's something there that's affirming caregivers and providing them resources, that would be my my wish is like, when that changes, I know that this has really started to sink in for people. Well, let me follow that up with, why do you think it is almost lacking or non-existent that there isn't a lot of attention paid to caregivers and family caregivers in the healthcare system? I, it's, it's, I don't actually know. I know right. I've tried to approach some hospitals um, myself as far as like offering my resources and speaking. I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but I do feel like they're a little bit like a mini government for some reason. Right. Like they have their own thing. Oh, we have, they think they may be doing that already. Like, oh, we have somebody that when they discharge, we transition them like, well, that's interesting. Cause I, you know, that wasn't my experience and I'm hearing from other people that's not their experience. So, you know, does it really exist? Like I would have them question it. Like if they, right. if they think that it really exists, um, and, and until they start kind of investing and seeing that need. And I think maybe where, you know, you have to kind of sometimes follow the money on these things, but it, it is a win win situation for healthcare professionals and hospitals to give family caregivers these resources to empower them and make them feel more confident in this very important role because if they fail at this role you potentially could have two patients or you can have readmission which i know is a thing that they try to avoid so there's no reimbursement if there's a readmittance within a certain amount of time for the same yes. diagnosis right exactly i'm not sure why that hasn't gotten the attention it deserves do, do you have an opinion on this lance i'm interested i well, I, I think I think it goes back to education. I really do. I, you know, we have encountered in our communities, you know, there are some discharged nurses, there are some social workers that, you know, they do ask the questions of, we're sending Mrs. Jones home, you know, she just had a major hip replacement, you know, here are some resources for the area on aging or, you know, the local home care community, you know, and providers. But that's typically not the rule. That's the exception. So I don't, I don't know if it's more of a tunnel vision and it's very unintentional. I don't think they're not providing it, but I just think that it goes back to their training, their education. And, you know, and in some states, home care is not looked at as a healthcare quote unquote provider. Um, so I think that plays a role as well. And I think it is still a fairly new section or, you know, division of healthcare that, 
it's still not really caught on significantly. Like, you know, the experience I was telling you about, about that couple where for several years they were having home health care come out, which is well known and it's referred and it's prescribed. And never once were they ever recommended to look into home care to provide that, you know, those ADLs and that daily support. Yeah. Even but, the difference between home health care and home so care. Can you at least even share the difference in that? Like exactly. I'm, I'm learning a whole new, I've had to learn a whole new vocabulary as a yeah. family caregiver. Like, you know, I didn't make this up, but a friend said it, she said, she's getting her master's in caregiving. And I'm like, that is so true. Like yeah. I have, I've gotten my master's and I've learned terminology and even just assuming that we know that verbiage is in fact i just had this question on this event that i did earlier at the q a they said well how do we do you know my tip was to get the paperwork and the assessment done how do we do that if we haven't gotten a referral like they think they need a referral for yes. this yes you yeah. don't need one for home care these are right. these are hands for you to be able to go and grab and hold um it's so many things i you know learning yesterday that you know medicaid can potentially help pay for home care like that. Um, I had, you know, always thought, oh, I met that it was a five year look back and things like that. But that's really for long term care facilities and communities, not home care. And I'm like, whoa, like, why is this so hard to get our information and, out to people? Well, and I will say too, Elizabeth, depending on the state, too, because, you know, Medicaid's regulated by the states, Medicare is regulated by the federal government. So states all have their own policies, reimbursements and different, you know, qualifications and whatnot. But I know some states, Medicaid will even pay that family caregiver for yes. the hours they're caring for their loved one. Now, I will say on the flip side of that, most home care companies don't accept Medicaid. And that's unfortunate, but it's due to the reimbursement rate being so low that a lot of the staff are being paid more than what the Medicaid is reimbursing. So it really is counterintuitive. And, but if you're a family caregiver, I would recommend looking into Medicaid supplementing or reimbursing you for the hours, you'll get approved for a certain amount of hours and go through the qualification to get approved. And, you know, at least if you are a family caregiver and maybe you had to take a FMLA leave or, you know, whatever your situation is, because again, that's another thing we haven't discussed. Family caregivers, a lot of times they're not able to hold down their job because they are now in a situation they have to take care of a spouse, a child or a parent or a loved one. And most employers, they don't have that benefit where we'll just work when you're able to, you know, they're going to fill that role or that job because, you know, again, they're a business and they have to continue, you know, progressing and filling their needs. So, I mean, there's a lot of obstacles and, you know, challenges that family caregivers face. And it's just remarkable what you've established with the healthy, the happy, healthy caregiver. Um, and we will have all the links in the show notes and the summaries and up on the screen here for our listeners and viewers um, to reach out to you because you're, you know, you're a wealth of information and resources for these families and they don't have to live locally, right? You can meet with them virtually or however right. you can help. So yes. another question I wanted to ask you though, is what advice would you give to other caregivers? You've offered some wonderful tips and resources, but what advice would you give them who are just maybe starting out in this role? I mean, there's so one of the biggest emotions is particularly in the beginning is the guilt. I mean, yeah. you know, it's I wrote about, you know, it felt like a nest of hungry birds where there's just like everybody's screaming for a little piece of you, your job, your husband, your kids, your care recipient, like your friends, like every and it just feels like you cannot be enough in any of these. And my biggest advice for family caregivers is when the guilt starts to creep up replace it in self-talk it with a different g word which is grace more grace less guilt wonderful wonderful so what uh what's next for the happy healthy caregiver oh i'm never going to be bored lance uh it's uh you know where i've been focusing my attention mostly is on really 
and um, helping to scale the message to getting reaching more caregivers is one I love when other people pay for the resources for caregivers and so working with employers working with organizations on speaking is a big thing. Um, and then also like I'm finding out about resources for caregivers all the time I love to i'm not afraid of technology with my background I love to try things out I like to see if they would would have worked for me in my role and then share them and and for a lot of new businesses that are entering this space, I can be a valuable partner and a collaborative partner with them to um, fast track their resource to the caregiving community. That's so great. those are some of the places that I focus my attention. Um, but the podcast, everything else just kind of it, it all stays out there too. Well, I was gonna say you, you know, the happy, healthy caregiver, you have a YouTube channel, which we'll have a link for you have the podcast, which is on all major podcast streaming platforms as well. You're on Instagram, you're everywhere. So it's very, you're very accessible. So people can easily find you. And again, we will have the links to you. Uh, one question I wanted to leave you with, and I always find this one a challenging question because again, everybody's family dynamic is different and everybody's situation is different and their backgrounds are different. So the answers don't always fit one person, but they might fit another. What is the best advice you can give to a family who may be in a caregiving situation that is almost resentful? And I mean resentful, not that they have to do it, but the person they're caring for might have been an absent parent. They might have been an abusive parent or a neglectful parent or you know, any number of just, you know, unfortunate situations. And now they found themselves as that person's caregiver. Mm -hmm. How do you best address those past emotions and feelings for going forward? Because you're also might gonna take some, you know, unfortunate negative situations. And I, I, I'm using this loosely, but even maybe some abuse now. Yeah. And you're that person's caregiver. I mean, that that's a horrible situation. And what advice do you give families who are in those? It, it's a, it is a horrible situation. You know, it's every like to your point, every sibling, you know, I'm one of six kids, but we all have a different relationship with my parents. Um, and even to just assume that we all have the, a happy relationship is not a, a correct assumption. Right. Uh, I, you know, I think for one, it's like, we do have a choice. Ultimately, we don't have to do this. You might feel like you have to do it. But and then the other thing is like the emotions that you're bringing up, like the resentment and things, naming them and feeling them um, and talking about them, I think is is critical. Um, it's OK to have these feelings that that and then to be, you know, to be validated that it is OK to have these feelings. And so I think that's where you, having conversations with a, a caregiving coach such as myself or tapping into this, you know, local support community, you got to find the people who are going to understand and meet you where you are because it is hard. It's very hard. And I had a pretty lovely relationship with my parents, but I know people that have not. And it's um, get a team involved, you know, so it's not all on you. And that's where we, you know, we try to put the sustainable strategies in there together and then make sure that they're getting the therapy and the support and the validation um, that they need. And then a, a lot of it is about the boundaries and making sure and sometimes very lovely people, I'm sure, as you've seen, Lance, like their behaviors completely change in their personalities with cognitive decline. And it's horrific. You know, I had a lovely aunt who was um, physically like used to talk about her daughter all the time and then my my cousin was in this role where she was getting you know her mom was physically hurting her she had to call she had to call um you know for enforcement to come and and take care of that and she had to do some really hard things um getting you know allowing the outside world to come in and kind of see what it's really like for people so that they can get the services and the resources that they need and um you know her first intention was to to improve it and try to make it look better and, and put some, and I thought, and I said, no, this is not going to help you ultimately. Like you're gonna have to like pull back the curtains and, and do the heavy lifting and the hard work to, in order to get this situation to overall improve. Okay, well, that's wonderful. And, you know, again, families face different circumstances. They have different backgrounds and experiences with their loved ones and, you know, ultimately, you know, they need that support. They need to know they're not alone. and 
the happy, healthy caregivers there to make sure that they don't. And we just really appreciate your time today, Elizabeth. Thank you, Lance. Thanks for all that you do to support what the messages that I put out and then all the valuable content that you put out through All Home Care Matters. It's um, We're stronger together for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to talking to you again in the future. Take care. As a sandwich generation working family caregiver, I used to be the one to take my mom to her doctor's appointments. And she used to get so frustrated with me. I would leave enough time in the morning where I felt like we had enough time to get ready and get where we needed to be in Atlanta traffic, but it was never enough time. She always said I moved too fast for her. She also wondered why we had to get up so early. She was not really an early bird, she was a night owl. Early appointments worked better for my life as the kids always had things going on in the afternoon and work tended to have more meetings. But I also found that early morning appointments or the first appointment after lunch tended to be more on time. Eventually I figured out that I needed to double the time that it took to get to the doctor's appointment. Mom just needed to move a little slower. We needed to have more conversation. We needed to have some sips of coffee. Sometimes we would have words with each other. We would be so frustrated with the whole experience. But as soon as we got into the car, her car by the way, because that's the one that she could ride in most comfortably, I would quickly turn it to the 50s music channel on XM radio and things would suddenly shift into a different mood. We'd be reminiscing about old times. So music just really was a mood shifter for us. Follow for more caregiving and self-care tips. Thank you for joining us today here at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions, every form is read and responded to. And remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms or watch the show on our official YouTube channel. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. We'd also like to again thank Elizabeth Miller from the Happy Healthy Caregiver for joining us today, providing wonderful family caregiver tips, resources, and information. Make sure to visit Elizabeth at the Happy Healthy Caregiver. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you next time here at All Home Care Matters. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.